Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Leadership Institute's May Wednesday Wake Up Club Breakfast. Uh, I would hope this perhaps could be our last no-calorie breakfast conducted uh, on Zoom and that we can resume again our uh, earlier morning breakfast, but we shifted it uh, to this time uh, in order to draw a greater number of people uh, on Zoom. Um, I'm, I'm Morton Blackwell, president of the Leadership Institute. And this breakfast has been going on for a, a number of years and has a loyal following and pre presents as we are uh, today, very interesting information. We live in interesting times. Uh, focus across the nation has been on national politics, what's going on in the executive branch, what's going on in the legislative branch of the federal government, but there has recently been an uptick of, in, of interest in local elections, particularly school board elections. A recent election in, uh, in Texas school board has piqued a big interest, and I'm happy to announce at this point that the Leadership Institute uh, is now uh, organizing a school focused specifically on school board elections, and it will be a comprehensive school talking about the uh, conservative issues that are important for school board, and then the mechanics of recruiting uh, and electing uh, candidates to the school board. So stand by, uh, that announcement will be made soon. I encourage you to live tweet today's event uh, with hashtag WWCB. In 2021, your Leadership Institute has already trained 3,730 conservatives at 131 separate training programs. Since 1979, the Institute has trained 234,455 activists, students, and leaders. At the end of this event, you will be redirected to the training schedule on the Leadership Institute website. There you will find all of the currently scheduled trainings. Please take a moment to review these schools and consider attending one or sending a friend to one of our trainings. If, if you are joining us over Zoom, there will be a chance to ask questions at the end of the talk. Please use the Zoom Q&A function to submit a question uh, should you have one. And, and now, uh, Kirsten Holmberg will give a program's report. Kirsten? All right, thank you, Morton. And thank you for everyone who is tuning in today. I'm happy to share the program's report with you all. Um, as we move into the summer, the political and fundraising division is gearing up to equip and train more conservative activists for the rest of 2021 and beyond. Um, now is the time to add the correct political technology to your tool belt. Um, the division's summer catalog is filled with LI's core campaign schools, including the Distinguished Campaign Management School, the Future Candidate School, and the Campaign Communicators School. Um, but there also are some new shorter workshops being added to the summer catalog as well, including the workshop on organizing your campaign team. Just last week, the political and fundraising division premiered the new campaign advance workshop where 45 conservatives learned from a top tier lineup of faculty who brought more than 30 years of state and presidential campaign advance experience. Um, with the world of campaign advance changing with each election, and advance finally gaining a seat at the campaign table, uh, the workshop filled a gap many conservative activists were looking for. Um, in addition to the upcoming schools and workshops, the division also rolled out a new political and fundraising monthly email. 
where readers can gain an inside scoop into all the upcoming political and fundraising trainings. Um, the email also includes an interview with one of LI's distinguished faculty members each month, as well as news on tips and tricks and trends that are happening in the world of campaign, world of fundraising. Um, I will drop a link in for those who are interested in signing up for that monthly email down below. Um, and that wraps up the political and fundraising division report. Thank you, Morton. Thank you, Kirsten. People might I'd like to know that Kirsten is a proud graduate of Grove City College, uh, an institution that believes in the principles of faith and freedom. Preparing activists to run and support conservative campaigns is imperative now more than ever. Leadership Institute's vital and dependable donors make trainings like these possible. Now, it's my pleasure to present our featured speaker. Dr. James Lindsay is an American born author, mathematician and political commentator. He has written six books spanning a range of subjects, including religion, the philosophy of science and postmodern theory. He is the founder of New Discourses, a media site and educational resource for those who have seen the negative effects of that critical social justice has had on the political environment, both on the left and on the right. He recently wrote a book critiquing these critical theories called Cynical Theories, How Activist Scholarship Made Everything About Race, Gender, and Identity and why this harms everybody. A long title, but I'm sure the book will be of interest to many. In 2017, he, along with two other professors, led the Grievance Studies Affair, a hoax which they conducted to expose the broken peer review system in academia. 20 fake papers on the topics of cultural, queer, race, gender, fat, and sexuality studies were submitted to academic journals for review, and several of them passed the review process for publication. Dr. Lindsay attended Tennessee Technological University, where he obtained both his BS and MS in mathematics. He later obtained his PhD in mathematics from the University of Tennessee in 2010 and he's a frequent lecturer, writer, and guest on popular podcasts, including the Joe Rogan Experience. Again, I encourage you to ask questions using the Zoom Q&A function throughout Dr. Lindsay's talk, and he will have time to answer some of these questions at the end. Dr. Lindsay. Thank you, Martin. Um, very pleased to be here, very uh, honored to get to speak to this group uh, at this breakfast. Um, I'm supposed to talk everywhere I go now about critical race theory. I'm glad you actually mentioned the election that just took place in the school board in Texas, in Dallas, and if I'm not mistaken, in a district that leaned to Biden, and we saw a 70 to 30 split voting against critical race theory. So a very early message that I just want to plant in everybody's head is that there is a tremendous amount of grassroots energy right now within people almost across the political spectrum, but certainly within all conservatives against critical race theory. Critical race theory has become a recognized term. It's an idea that people understand uh, as a problem. They may not understand the details. I'm going to try to help you understand a little bit more about critical race theory today so that you can be equipped. But I will advise, you know, if you're interested in being or training activists to work in conservative causes and get involved in these local or even state or even national elections in any, any regard, that the energy around this right now is more or less white hot it's it's eff effectively off of the charts and um it is a strongly winning issue to try to address because people perceive that critical race theory is a problem they perceive that critical race theory is dangerous they do not want it in their schools they do not want their children being indoctrinated in it they do not want it actually in 
their workplaces, if that can be arranged as well. And they're all kind of being force fed this and they're very aware of it. So I really want everyone here to kind of go forward from today thinking that this is a very important issue and that there's a lot of energy in taking it on. Now, what I want to try to do for you today is to try to give you some sense of the breadth and depth of critical race theory and its related uh the, the related subjects like we, we just heard with the so-called grievance studies affair that we did, queer studies, uh, post-colonial theory, um, sexuality studies, fat studies, disability studies, we could go on and on. In fact, one of their most prominent scholars, a woman named Judith Butler, who is relatively famous enough to where she doesn't need much introduction, uh, referred to these things as that exasperated, et cetera, where you have to try to name all of these different things. That huge umbrella of concepts that are similar to but different from critical race theory is what we we have referred to as critical social justice. So you've probably heard that there's this movement that every, everybody's been pushing for social justice, social justice, social justice. And um, there are a lot of different domains in which that becomes relevant. Critical race theory is one. It deals with race in a particular way. That way is, the, the, we could say, the critical social justice way. But to get academic and technical, it's called critical constructivism, which means it is the combination of critical theory, other, in other words, neo-Marxism and postmodernism. Uh, constructivism is, refers to social or cultural constructivism, which is a postmodern idea of how they think about knowledge and how society is organized around knowledge and discourses and the way that we use language. Whereas critical is a particular means by which you analyze society. It is not the same critical as critical thinking. And in fact, it's a perversion of that that uses the same word on purpose. And that's another theme that we will run into a lot within the idea of critical theory, by the way, is that they misuse words intentionally to with, with double meanings frequently to try to be able to move their ball. But it also, it's not just, as you will probably be aware, it's not just critical race theory that's the issue. You've probably seen a lot of the things that are going on with trans activism. You've seen these bills to try to, to, to protect women's sports from uh, transgender participants, biological males participating in women's sports, where they obviously have a gigantic unfair advantage, uh, women and girls sports, I should say. You've probably seen the issues around whether or not children should be you know, induced into having puberty blockers given to them as a standard course of treatment if they have something called gender dysphoria. Uh, and you've seen a lot of ideological pushes around this that try to deny the fact that this has any you know social component to why it's happening. Why has there been a 4,000 or whatever it is percent, I don't know the actual statistic, but it's somewhere in that vicinity, uh, increase in the number, especially of young girls who are identifying as gender dysphoric and thus trans in the past you know five or six years. That's an unbelievable you know, uh, increase. Why is that happening? Well, you know, there's a hypothesis called the social contagion hypothesis, uh, that explains it, but you're not allowed to talk about that because of the ideology. Well, that's all under the umbrella of queer theory, which is a sister theory to, um, critical race theory. And I would like to convince you that they actually share most of the underlying architecture, but kind of in different ways. Critical race theory is more rooted in neo-Marxism, whereas queer theory is more rooted in postmodernism. There are others in the United States. We don't deal very much, although we have this tremendous crisis on our southern border, uh, but we don't deal very much with post-colonial theory. But if we look to our friends throughout the Commonwealth, uh, the British Commonwealth, they do in Britain, in Canada, in Australia, in parts of Africa. We hear tremendously about the issues of, of post-colonialism. And so this is yet another sister theory. So I'm trying to give you a sense right now that there's a lot of breadth to what's going on. This is a very complicated thing. It's easy to describe, in fact, as like a hydra, where you take on, say, critical race theory and you defeat the critical race theory head of the monster and the queer theory head bites you or the post-colonial theory head you know, knocks you off of your feet. So it, it's a very complicated thing that is, it's, it's evolved over the past century, or we could say two centuries, depending on how we want to put the, the, the beginning of this kind of line of thought, um, but especially over the last century, to be very difficult to challenge, very difficult to defeat, and in particular to take over from within academia, which is why we did the so-called grievance studies affair. So there is a great deal of breadth to this. Critical social justice is their approach. I don't know what you might think about the idea of social justice. I have a complicated set of thoughts. I think it's one of those terms that has two meanings. I think on the one hand, there is a safe meaning that most people in society, I think, agree with by default now, which is that we do hope for a more fair 
more equal, less discriminatory, less stereotypical, less prejudiced society. We do not want to see people held back on account of their, how they happen to have been born, uh, the accidents of birth, as I said. Most people believe in social justice in that kind of very general sense. But if you read in the literature, the academic literature around social justice theory, not even without getting into critical social justice specifically, what you see is they say things, and this is close to a quote from an education textbook, but I haven't read it in a little while, so I'll get the quote a little bit wrong. But they say that whereas, uh, whereas the idea of, of, of justice focuses on individual rights, social justice focuses on group rights. And that's a concerning statement because there are no such things as group rights. Groups don't have rights. Individuals have rights. Individuals within groups might have rights. And if you were, for example, excluding people from their individual rights because of a group membership, you might have an issue, but this is a completely different thing. To talk about group rights is already a concerning thing because it's, it's a category error, it, just to be too logical about things and a mathematician speak coming out. Groups don't have rights, individuals have rights. So you already have this kind of disjunction here. And then when you add in the critical side, critical social justice, whether it's looking at post-colonialism, critical race theory, um, queer theory, disability studies, fat studies, sexuality studies, and so on. When you add in the critical theory aspect now, which is what critical social justice is, now what you're saying is that you very specifically want to achieve group rights, in other words, through identity politics, by means of using critical theory. And critical theory is a very specific thing. And that's a question that we should be asking. Do we think that this is, even if you're a believer in social justice, if however you want to define that term, whichever of those two meanings that I've already given you subscribe to, even if you're a, sub a supporter of social justice, do we want to use critical theory to get there? Do we believe in that method? And that's a very important question because critical theory is where now I want to start talking about the depth of this. So critical theory, if you don't know, was devised, it was first formally described in 1937. So it's not new, but the underpinnings of critical theory were first laid out in the very late 1910s and very early 1920s. And certainly by, there's kind of a relatively impactful meeting in 1923 in Vienna between a handful of communists, including uh, Antonio Gramsci, who's an Albanian Italian who wrote the prison notebooks, uh, which is uh, over 3000 pages of kind of the most, most, um, poignant, to be honest with you, communist analysis that's ever probably been done. If you want to learn how to take over a culture to make room for communism, Antonio Gramsci laid this out in his prison notebooks, but he didn't write those by 1923. He wrote them in prison, which he went to in 1926. So his mind was there, but those ideas hadn't been had co been codified. But he also met with a, a man named uh, George Lukács, and George Lukács was a Hungarian who was one of the people who helped orchestrate the communist revolution of Hungary in in the late 1910s. I don't remember if it was 1918 or 1919, but it fell apart after eight to nine months. The the Hungarians resisted this and pushed it back off. So the architect of this co literal communist revolution was in this meeting, and also a man named Max Horkheimer who went on to become the first director of the Institute for Social Research at Goethe University in Frankfurt, Germany, better known as the Frankfurt School, which I will sum summarily call the Frankfurt School because I'm American and I'll just mess it up. And I'm, I'm close enough to Kentucky to get away with it. Um, so I'm in Tennessee, if you don't know. So um, the goal of Max Horkheimer's Frankfurt School was to take these ideas that Lukács and uh, Gramsci and he and others all communists had kind of cooked up to try to figure out why won't Western civilization succumb to communism? Why did it work in Russia, a peasant society, 85, 90% peasant, whereas Marx had predicted that communist revolutions would happen in the most industrial cities, the most industrial city, uh, societies, most industrial countries. Britain didn't have, London and Britain did not go communist. They resisted it. Berlin wasn't going communist. It resisted it. New York wasn't going communist. America wasn't going communist. Why not? And they pinned the needle on or pin the tail, I guess, on Western culture. And what they realized was that if you want to make room for a communist style revolution in the West, you have to undermine Western culture from within. And so this was Antonio Gramsci's idea of uh, cultural hegemony. He believed that Western culture had a, a hegemonic power to it where this is just the, the accepted way that it is, the status quo. This is how we organize our society. And this is past generation 
to generation by by means like religion and family. It's it's passed from one generation to the next through education. It's passed to the existing population through media and law. So these five pillars of culture that Gramsci identified, edu family, religion, education, media, and law, became the targets, the pillars upon which that he said that you have to undercut if you want to create room for a communist revolution in the West. And the way that you do that, he said, is that you infiltrate them, you get inside of them. You don't try to fight them from the outside. You instead get inside of them. You go inside and you start slowly changing the cultural mores. You start slowly changing the cultural values. You start slowly changing the way people think about those institutions from within and create what he called a counter hegemony from within. Max Horkheimer at this meeting goes on to found and direct the Institute for Social Research, and he is the one who, in 1937, defined what critical theory is for the first time. And so what is a critical theory? A critical theory, to boil it down as is done, not by Horkheimer himself, who's very verbose, but by the, um, the, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, which I think is an authoritative enough resource on this topic. They say that a, a critical theory must contain three components. And those three components can be described as that it has an idealistic vision for society. In other words, really a utopian vision, a communist vision, frankly, for society. It must then tell how the society or analyze how the society that we currently live in does not live up to that vision or is not headed toward that vision. And then it must inspire also social activism on its behalf. Uh, and so you have to have a utopian vision, complain about why society is not headed toward utopia, which of course it never would, and then inspire social activists to try to do what? To infiltrate those cultural institutions from within, to start changing their culture from within. And so I recently gave a talk, in which I described critical race theory as the tip, and I, got, I, I laugh because I got made fun of for this phrasing, um, as, the, as the tip of a 100 year long spear. I guess spears are measured in feet, not years, but um, you get what I'm saying. We have, a, a, we have literally a meeting in Vienna in 1923 between a handful of communists, including three very prominent ones who had come up with a new way of thinking about the world that's now about communist theory, in particular, it's now called neo-Marxism. Uh, critical theory is the brainchild that came out of this. And so now when we look at something like a critical social justice movement, which includes critical race theory, we have to ask ourselves, do we want to use that particular method in order to try to achieve social justice? So my, my thesis was whether you believe in social justice or not, whether you find yourself leaning left, leaning right in the center, libertarian or whatever, and you think, yeah, you know, more fairness in society is good, or even maybe we should consider whether or not people are being excluded from individual rights by group. And maybe even you could go further. I doubt anybody in this audience, but some people might say, yeah, maybe group rights does have something that makes sense to it. Even if you have all of that, you still have the open question of whether or not you want to approach those issues through a tool of critical theory. Because what critical theory is going to do is it's going to begin from the assumption that the society that we live in currently is itself constructed out of systems of power and oppression that serve the dominant interests, what Marx would have called the bourgeois interests and that the neo-Marxists occasionally call, call the bourgeois interests, but the dominant interests of society at the expense of everybody else. So you still have this kind of Marxian exploitative vision of how society is constructed. Um, the neo-Marxists were not strictly Marxists. They were not particularly interested in seizing the means of economic production. They instead wanted to seize the means of cultural production. They're not so concerned with who has wealth, just a little bit, uh, it's not a very class-oriented uh, way of thinking, although they do talk about it. They're interested in who has cultural power or otherwise known as privilege. And so it is now, rather than seizing the means of producing economic power or economic uh, wealth, it's now who and how do we produce privilege and how do we redistribute privilege in society? That's the new objective. That's what neo-Marxism kind of brought to this this perspective and critical theory is the tool by which they agitate to try to make people aware in the words of the next director of the uh, Frankfurt School, I said it right that time, uh, Herbert Marcuse. Herbert Marcuse laid out that what that, that in the consumerist society that we live in with all of its various systems of power that structure society, this is writing in, in One Dimensional Man, his most famous book, which he wrote in 1964, and in that first year sold over 300,000 copies in the 60s. Think about that for a second. So we're talking about a, a leftist intelligentsia rock star at the time. He says in there that, that people are controlled 
people are actually within within consumer societies and with all of these systems of power are not thinking in terms of their own interests. They're thinking in terms of what he called heteronymous interests. So the people making the products and selling them to you through advertisements, that's an interest that they're putting onto you. They're projecting onto you. And so you're thinking in terms of their interests when you think you think you're, you're thinking in terms of your own interests. And then the your boss who wants you to show up to work and to, to do your job and keep your mouth shut and just be a good employee and do what you're told and not complain and you know do a little bit more and don't worry about that you're not getting paid as much as you deserve well you're operating within his interests and his job is to convince you culturally speaking and this this and cultural marxism kind of mentality his job is to convince you that you are actually getting a good deal out of this when you look at the you know nature of pop culture, the music, the advertisements, the television shows, the way that people hang out and spend time, the f- sports that they watch, popular culture all feeds into this idea of, hey, our culture's great. Hey, you're not oppressed. Hey, you probably enjoy life. And this all creates a series of heteronymous, meaning outside of yourself, uh, interests, many, many different interests outside of you that are actually controlling how you think such that he goes so far as to say that you are no longer even a rational person in and of yourself. You're acting irrationally if you are not conscious of this in the same way that Marx meant conscious of class when he said that we must raise class consciousness. Well, Marcuse wanted to raise critical consciousness that makes you aware of the various heteronymous interests and the way that the society is constructed to keep you down. And that also includes, especially, I mean, to, to, to some credit in 1964 writing that there are white supremacist interests and that there are, um, you know, anti-gay interests and so on. There are patriarchal interests and that you basically are being brainwashed into believing something that isn't even in your own best interest that for, for Marcuse neglects what he called certain historical possibilities that have become regarded as utopian possibilities. If you want to know specifically what he's talking about, we can refer to his 1969 essay on liberation, where he says that what that means is socialism, but without the bureaucracies, as if that's real. Um, But the real name for a socialism without a bureaucracy, if you've read Marx, is communism, because Marx's vision was that socialism would replace uh, capitalism. And it would have to be bureaucratic in its early instantiation. And then as people progress through the dialectical materialism to understand the contradictions in the system, that were still inherent there, that eventually the state would become redundant and drop away. In other words, there'd be no bureaucratic apparatus over the top. And so we would now enter into a non-bureaucratic socialism, which is called communism, the last stage of history, or actually the end of history, as Marx laid it out. And that's with a capital H history. So Marcuse had these exact same ideas. And um, Marcuse can't be credited entirely for the birth of critical race theory specifically, or any of these other critical theories, but you do have to give him some credit for this because also in one dimensional man, he lays out this idea that the leftist intelligentsia, which would be intelligentsia, by the way, doesn't mean smart people. It means people who have bought into this particular view of the world in one way or another. This was a Leninist term. Um, So the leftist intelligentsia have to team up. Mostly academics like himself have to team up with the racial minorities and the radical outsiders, people like the weatherman underground. Uh, And they need to team up and create basically a large coalition that's going to start achieving Basically, what was 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 um, Antonio Gramsci's plan in the first place that got named by Rudy Deutschke in the 1960s, the long march through the institutions. So they have to start infiltrating and getting inside the institutions. Now, the, there's an open question whether Deutschke had read Gramsci, because Gramsci wasn't translated into English until 1970 by Pete Buttigieg's dad, as it turns out. Joseph Buttigieg at Notre Dame translated it. Um, interesting little connection there. But it was not translated into English. Deutschke may have read it in Italian. I uh, may have read it in some other language. I don't know. But it was certainly smuggled to Moscow in 1937 on Gramsci's death. And so the common turn, the Third International Communist Party, had it. It's not known for certain whether or not Mao gained access to it, but the kind of academic consensus around Mao and Gramsci, the Mao-Gramsci connection is that, and, and this is an exact quote from a scholar, Mao did what Gramsci thought. And Deutschke was known and Marcuse were known to be watching Mao, of course, the propaganda aspect that made it to the West, uh, not the real aspect. It's not like they went to China and saw what was going on and thought, wow, this actually works. The Cultural Revolution actually works. And so their vision was to infiltrate the institutions of the West with a long march to the institutions that was modeled off of Mao, that probably was modeled off of Gramsci uh, one way or another with the goal of eventually affecting a cultural revolution in the West that would make room for 
a communist state in the West, especially in America. Well, welcome to uh, what started at May 25th, 2020, when George Floyd died and our cultural revolution began in earnest. Uh, their, their vision has come to pass. This is what we are in. We are living through a cultural revolution right now. It is not clear that they're going to win. Um, the American people have slightly different fiber uh, than, than some of our fellows around the world. But this is actually, when I say that this is a 100 year long, I know that's a weird metaphor, spear, where critical race theory becomes its tip, I really do mean that. And why is critical race theory the tip of this 100 year long spear? Well, let's go back to another communist, uh, Bella Dodd, Dr. Bella Dodd. She was actually a defected member of Communist Party USA. She was active in the 20s and 30s and 40s in the Communist Party USA. Um, in 1953, for whatever reason, she had defected by this point, and she testified to the House Committee on Un-American Activities, which is often um, wrongly conflated with McCarthyism. McCarthy, you might remember, was a senator, and the House Committee has nothing to do with the Senate. But uh, nevertheless, the House Committee, by the way, for Un-American Activities was dissolved, of course, but its duties have all been uh, assumed by the House Judiciary Committee. So it actually still exists, and literally all of its duties still exist within the House of Representatives and the House Judiciary Committee, which you can look at what they're doing now, now that they've been fully infiltrated, uh, you can see how that's all working out. Um, what she testified, though, was that the communists, as early as the 1920s, realized that the wedge issue that would tear America apart is race. America was too sensitive around race. There was too much uh, grievance. There's too much resentment. There's too much injury. The scab is too easily picked. The wound is too deep underneath it. And that if you pick at race enough and in a skillful way that you can actually tear apart the cultural hegemony of the United States and open the door to communism. This turns out to be actually was known in China as well. Uh, expert on Chinese and Taiwanese affairs uh, wrote me a brilliant essay that I published on New Discourses a few months ago, where he discussed how they literally, like you talk about, we hear everything's white supremacy. Everything is white supremacy, whiteness, white this, white that, white this, good whites, bad whites, everything. White, white, white. That's here now, today. Well, in the 1930s in China, before Mao was able to step into this damaged culture, it was Han supremacy. People in the party labeled themselves as good Hans, who were going to help usher uh, a more racially harmonious for the 56 races of China where Hans are not just the ones that gain all of the, the power. The exact same dynamics, the exact same phrasing, the exact same everything, take out white, replace with Han, Chinese. It was used in China to break apart their culture. The communists realized it would work in China, and then it did. They realized it would work in America, and they didn't have their tool until one of Herbert Marcuse's students, Angela Davis, very famous woman, radical, uh, went to prison, was uh, eventually got out of prison, eventually became an education activist, along with people like Bill Ayers and the rest of these people that were, were in the Weatherman Underground. They all gave up their radicalism after Marcuse talked to them, basically, and convinced them that they should all become education K-12 through activists uh, to infiltrate one of those five pillars of culture, namely the education pillar. Uh, well, Angela Davis became, in her own words, was radicalized by Herbert Marcuse. She is through and through a critical theorist in the old school Frankfurt School sense, but she also is a black feminist and black feminism is its own line of thought. I'm not saying that she is a black person who happens to be a feminist. They call those people feminists of color. She's a black feminist, which is you, they don't usually capitalize the F they usually capitalize the B of course, but you could capitalize them both and make it a proper noun because it is a, a identifiable line of thought. And that line of thought was largely developed out of what was known as black liberationism, which is a very radical approach. You often hear words like black separatism and black nationalism associated with it that was running in parallel to the civil rights movement of the 1960s. And so black liberationism leading into when it mixed with radical feminism gives birth to this idea of black feminism. And so Angela Davis brings her black feminism, combines it with Marcuse's very radical Frankfurt School critical theory ideas in ways to dive in and tear apart a culture from within to awaken people from their false consciousness now about race. So now you have to, and you hear this, we have to awaken a racial consciousness. People need to have their racial consciousness awakened. Same consciousness as critical consciousness, same consciousness as class consciousness, exact same idea, just reappropriated to different contexts. 
And Angela Davis goes on to inspire some of the people, including, I don't know how much she interfaced with Derek Bell specifically at Harvard Law, who is the originator of critical race theory. But Derek Bell didn't even name critical race theory, critical race theory. His student, Kimberly Crenshaw, also at Harvard Law, and the creator of intersectionality named critical race theory, critical race theory. And Kimberly Crenshaw writes in her most influential paper that she owes a debt of gratitude to Angela Davis for helping develop these thoughts. It's definitely the case that Angela Davis and the black feminists were very active in what's known as the Combahee River Collective, which was a very radical black, it's a lot of words, queer black feminist socialist organization that arose in the 1970s and coined the term identity politics in 1977. So by the way, if you ever hear people say Martin Luther King was engaging in identity politics, well, probably not because what was meant by identity politics wasn't even de described properly until 1977 by these queer, radical, what is it, radical queer black feminist socialists in the Combahee River Collective um, in the 1970s. And if you read stuff from the Combahee River Collective and then you read Kimberly Crenshaw, who also mentions them, so she was definitely aware of them, you can see that like Crenshaw probably isn't as creative as history is crediting her with. She just imported a lot of those ideas. So critical race theory has this direct connection back through Marcuse, back to Gramsci, um, with this intention, a hundred year long intention to conquer the West from within, to create counter hegemony and to use race as the issue that would tear the country apart. Um, so this is where critical race theory comes from. So now you see something like this critical social justice thing is very broad. And then you have this also great amount of depth, 100 year long project to basically have developed this kind of cultural super weapon that's now ripping America apart. But what is, you know, we can spend a few minutes now to talk about what critical race theory is specifically. We don't have to dive into queer theory and post-colonial theory and all the different ones. You, if you want to read about those and you want to read about the postmodern influence on how these things were, were uh, adopting postmodern ideas like the radical subjectivity and the idea that knowledge is socially constructed and that everything boils down to a cultural construct so that, you know, one race can't understand another because each one represents its own cultural group and each cultural group is kind of an island in, in and of itself. It's a mis appropriation of Michel Foucault's idea of the episteme. Um, I encourage you to read cynical theories and, and pick up that side of the context. But in the interest of time, we'll just dive into what critical race theory specifically is, because this is our hot button issue of the day. And it is the thing that needs to be understood the most clearly. So critical race theory describes itself just to tell you from the beginning as a movement. If you are an academic, that should strike you as odd. It should really strike you as odd that it can describes itself as a movement of scholars and activists because theories attempt to understand and describe the world usually. They're not usually movements made of activists unless you go back to Marx's maxim that you know philosophers hitherto have sought to understand the world, but the point is to change it. Unless you look at Max Horkheimer's idea that we have to separate traditional theories and which try to understand the world from critical theories, which try to change the world. So we're already seeing that critical race theory is in a long line of tradition that seeks to reorganize society. They say that what they want to do is transform the relationships between race, racism, and power. To, be, to do that, they begin with the kind of very postmodern assumption that race is socially constructed. It's not rooted in biology. It's not real. It's a social construct, but it's not just enough to say a lot of people would agree with that. You know, maybe race isn't that significant. Maybe they're not race realists. But what critical race theory would say, it goes further and it says that the races were actually socially constructed by white people specifically for the purposes of holding people of color and particularly black people down. Uh, white people constructed whiteness specifically to achieve anti-blackness. That is actually a tenet of critical race theory. And so you can see that there's this impossible divide, this impossible black-white divide built into critical race theory from the beginning. Its social constructivist thesis holds this. This is, of course, actually, it's, as I've said, not to be too intellectual, but the, it's critical constructivist thesis that society, critical theory would say that society is stratified according to different groups and that there's power dynamics across those groups and uh, that those power dynamics have to be interrogated by the means of critical theory to expose the contradictions that they, that they cause and, and then to synthesize them into a new more utopian vision of society as Marcuse put it, historical possibilities that have been re regarded now as, as utopian possibilities. The other basic assumption of critical race theory is that racism is systemic. That means it's not individual and it's not necessarily institutional. It is a artifact of the system itself. And the system actually means everything. 
everything that happens. It's how we talk. It's how we think things are, what we think is true and not true, how we're going to investigate ideas, how we're going to organize society, what the norms of society, what the ex expectations, if you and I meet and we're going to have a dialogue, there are expectations that guide, you know, I'm not going to punch you in the head. You're not going to say this. You're not going to insult my mother, whatever it happens to be. There are these norms and all of, we're not going to just become angry. We're going to try to, you know, stay a certain number of feet apart so that we don't get into people's personal space, et cetera. There's all these norms. That's all part of the system. And the system ultimately boils down for them to the the, the multiple systems that were, were devised in Europe under what's known broadly as the Enlightenment. Everything that follows from, from Western Enlightenment thinking, and I particularly mean Scottish, the Scottish Enlightenment, politically speaking, which is what led to the United States. That's what our Declaration of Independence, the philosophy that our Declaration of Independence and Constitution are ultimately based upon. But also the scientific uh, and even the, 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 the Reformation uh, religiously the, the, those lines of, of enlightenment thought uh, are also part of the foundation of the system. And these are the things that critical race theory calls into question fundamentally. Just to give you a couple of quotes to, to, to read directly from a textbook known as Critical Race Theory and Introduction, which is written by Richard Delgado and Gene Stefanczyk. They are, I don't know how much Gene Stefanczyk is, but, but Richard Delgado is now in his 80s and has been one of the biggest proponents and, and most famous proponents of critical race theory since the 1980s. And in the first paragraph of, of this textbook on critical race theory, a standard textbook on critical race theory, which bears the you know unassuming title, Critical Race Theory and Introduction, uh, they write, unlike traditional approaches to civil rights, which favor incrementalism and step-by-step -step progress, critical race theory calls into question the very foundations of the liberal order. In other words, what I just said about the Scottish, they, so they, they, they don't like traditional tr approaches to civil rights, and they don't like uh, the liberal order. In other words, the fruits of the Scottish Enlightenment. These include equality theory, legal reasoning, enlightenment rationalism, and the neutral principles of constitutional law. So they don't believe in equality. They don't believe in rule of law. They don't believe in rationalism as outlined by the enlightenment. They have other ways of knowing, as you may have heard. They prefer to dabble in subjective lived experience or more accurately phenomenological lived experience. And they do not believe in neutrality or principles of the constitution. Further down in the same book, a few pages later, they write that critical race theorists are highly suspicious of another liberal mainstay. This is when they're talking about their critique of liberalism, namely rights. So they are highly suspicious of the idea that individuals would have rights. So that systemic racism just becomes, the, it's the, 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 what makes the point of that spear that I've used in metaphor sharp. It is an argument by which you can say, even if nobody's acting in a racist way, even if you can't identify any racist thoughts or behavior in anybody, that the system itself is producing disparate outcomes and therefore racism must be present in the system somewhere. So you can keep dredging up racism even when you can't find it anywhere because it's now in the very organization of the system. We saw that, for example, I mean, there are lots of things that have gone around on the internet about this. We saw that, for example, maybe most poignantly when the uh, National African American History Museum from the Smithsonian put out that horrendous graphic last year, which I hope you've all seen, where they describe the the articles of white supremacy culture. But you can also see this for what it's worth in the educational programming, even in math education, math education in, Se uh, I shouldn't say Seattle, Washington, Oregon, and California. And it's sought to be adopted in other states now as well. Those, of course, were just the beginning. And where they say things like getting the right answer in math class is an aspect of white supremacy culture. Believing that math can be done in an individualist sense rather than as a collectivist sense is white supremacy culture. Things like uh, loyalty, punctuality, hard work, uh, achievement by your merits. These are all considered aspects of white supremacy culture, according to critical race theory. So it's a very worrying kind of uh, way to think about, about the world. It also proceeds from a number of assumptions. I'll try, I think these are dubious uh, and using a, a particular number of methods. I'd like to kind of just outline a number of these to give you some idea of how horrific this, this ideology is. But before I do that, I want to convince you that this is literally a worldview. This is not just a theory. It's not even just a movement. It is a way of thinking about the world. It is what, if you're, if you, if you're advocates of a theory or of an idea or of, of a movement are telling you that you have to develop a consciousness in it to understand it. And that if you don't have that consciousness, you probably have some kind of false consciousness. 
or some kind of internalized racism or internalized problem where you aren't able to think clearly, you are probably dealing with an entire way of viewing the world. You're not dealing with simply an analytical tool. You're not dealing with something that's simply to be described as a theory. You're describing a complete way to view the world. And this is exactly what Herbert Marcuse talks about in One Dimensional Man. He says that the heteronymous interests flatten life into a one-dimensional experience. And that if you awaken, you have to awaken a multidimensional consciousness to see the world in a different way. And if you don't, you have false consciousness. This is exactly what you see when you have people like Robin D'Angelo say that when you're challenged about race and racism in her peculiar way, that you lack the racial stamina, lack the racial humility to do the work of anti-racism, which she calls white fragility. It's exactly the same thing. You have to be awakened to the, to the critical race consciousness to understand it. This means it's a worldview. It is a way of interpreting all of the phenomena of the world, and I keep pointing at phenomenology for a reason, it's because when I said at the beginning, just as an aside, that we could earmark this as 100 years or 200 years. The 200 years dates back to Hegel in his Phenomenology of Spirit, which is 1807. But that's a, that's a digression. I would actually argue and can argue convincingly in a different one-hour talk that um, all of critical theory and critical race theory in particular are um, Hegelian based religions. They believe in the Hegelian faith. Uh, in fact, I have a video coming out about that soon. So you can keep your eyes open for that and check it out. But these assumptions that, that underline this worldview include ideas that racism is the ordinary state of affairs in society. Okay. So that's a, that's a direct statement that they make in virtually all of their textbooks. Racism is the ordinary state of affairs in society. It's not an aberration from them. It is what's happening regardless of what else is happening. Robin D'Angelo boils this assumption down to the simple question, the, the simple statement, the, 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 the question is no longer did racism take place, but how did racism manifest in this situation? So racism is to be assumed in every situation and the people who are competent to find it, maybe it's Dr. Seuss, for example, Maybe it's Coca-Cola, uh, you know, being too white or whatever they have. The people who are qualified to find it are called critical race theorists. And it is in their own words, everybody who has the racial privilege to do so has the duty to identify and disrupt this racial racist dynamic everywhere that they find it. This is a culture of white supremacy that they allege we live in. Um, this leads to what is known as the imminence of racism. The imminence of racism holds that, that racism is, is, is the default state of affairs right underneath the surface everywhere throughout society. And as the default state of affairs just underneath the surface, any individual or institutional act or outcome of racism is not an isolated incident. It's not one guy who is being a jerk. It's now indicative of a system that allows that to happen. And that's a very important way to think. It's like one, not to use kind of too medical or gross of a, of a metaphor, but it's like one boil that comes up in measles. The boil isn't the problem. The underlying virus that's systemic is the problem. So having a single, you know, boil or pox or whatever pop up on your skin is just indicative of a deeper underlying problem that is systemic. That's the way they think about racism. So if one guy says you know, one racist thing, that's because the society exists in a system that allows that to even have occurred which means this is a fundamentally to totalizing and thus totalitarian ideology that which is to stamp racism out entirely to the point where it's not even possible for racism to occur from any institution or individual whether by ignorance or by malice that's a very very concerning situation to kind of tie that to the moment though if you noticed when Derek Chauvin was was convicted on all three counts. Within minutes, you had people like Bernie Sanders and AOC coming out and saying, justice was not done. This is an act of accountability. Justice requires complete systemic change. It's because he's one boil of a measles, underlying measles disease. And until you completely remake the system in accordance with them, which will be achieved just by giving them power, by the way, and money, uh, until you completely remake the system, there is no justice. So... For them, justice means they have all the power and that they'll somehow magically make this work. This is exactly the same mentality that Marx had, is that when all of the, or the Bolsheviks, at least Lenin had, when all the Bolsheviks get the power, they'll be able to usher in the situation to which socialism will inexorably become a communist utopia. A third assumption is the imposition of racism. The claim, I already mentioned this, so I'll just be very brief about it, is that white people invented the races so that they could impose race and racism on other people so that they could control them. This leads into a further and deeper concept called interest convergence, which is a brainchild of Derek Bell, the first critical race theorist, uh, which states that, that, that white people 
don't go, don't ever help people of color. And we're talking mostly as uh, group levels, unless it's also in their own self-interest to do so. So anything that you do in accordance with keeping with what they define as racial progress is actually in your own self-interest because it makes you a better person. So therefore it was actually taking up anti-racism, for example, becomes a racist act under the, the, uh, doctrine of interest convergence. And they, they twist people for this. They're constantly problematizing allyship. They're constantly saying that it's not true, truly altruistic or truly selfless or true solidarity. Um, they also say that this creates a system in which uh, people in dominant positions in society, particularly here, white people are are, are put in a position of motivated ignorance. They often refer to this as active ignorance, pernicious ignorance, white ignorance, willful ignorance. They have lots of terms for this, where it is not to white people's advantage to become aware of the racial realities. In other words, how they describe race and racism, or in other words, critical race theory and accept those statements. It's not in apparently white people's self-interest as a group that's got power and privilege. Again, this is very Marxist conflict theory thought. Therefore, they are they don't they don't know and they don't want to know. They have an intentional uh, desire to stay ignorant of this. This enables things that they describe as like white comfort. Um, they want to rationalize white success and white privilege by claiming that, say, success is a result of merit. Meritocracy is something that they 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 really turn their guns on. Meritocracy is considered a pillar of white supremacy culture and critical race theory, and. This is a really poisonous doctrine then if you kind of understand what, what this is pointing to is it, it gives the ability for any time, literally any time anybody disagrees with critical race theory to say that they're acting in their own selfish interests. If it's a white person who does so, it's because they have white privilege and it's considered to be an aspect of white privilege which thus needs to be interrogated and rearranged and checked or whatever the other words are. If a person of color does it, uh, if that person is, as they say, brown, that probably means that they still have internalized anti-blackness. You see this a lot with the stop Asian American hate dynamic that's your narrative that's being pushed right now. Asian Americans have anti-blackness, anti so they're saying it over and over and over again. Um, if that person happens to be black, say like Barack Obama, then they will write a book in 2013 called Acting White to explain that he had to act white in order to gain that kind of position. And this is a huge kind of theory is like, or we see what's going on with, was it Tim Scott, uh, so-called uncle Tim that they're calling him kind of horrific. You can see how this just massively justifies racism. All of this basically boils down to However, the idea that critical race theory really operates on, which is called structural determinism, which is a very fancy academic term that basically means that the power dynamics, the systems of society as they have been created and organized lead to people in various identity groups, or in this case, racial groups under critical race theory, having their lives basically determined for them. It, it, determinism means you don't have any control, you don't have any agency. Well, for them, what they're claiming is that the system or the structure of society itself, the white supremacist structure of society itself is in fact creating certain outcomes. So when you have somebody who deviates from those outcomes, perhaps they got lucky, perhaps like Barack Obama, as they alleged, acted white to do so. Um, but most importantly, if they try to speak out against critical race theory, what you're going to find immediately is that they're going to be accused of speaking falsely to the lived experience that their group is supposed to have experienced. So now there is no longer the uh, individual of any race. Each individual person is just a kind of avatar or diplomat or something like that of that racial category. And critical race theory has defined what the, that experience of being that is. If it's white, it's privileged. If it's black, it's this. If it's brown, it's that. If it's Latino, it's that. But you're supposed to call them Latinx now or whatever other made up word. Um, I can explain that, but it's another talk for an, another time. Uh, so there's this idea, though, that life is determined based by what racial category you've had allegedly. Remember, it's been imposed upon you. You see that this is where Kimberly Crenshaw, in her most influential and famous paper, Mapping the Margins, writes that there's a fundamental difference between I am black and I am a person who happens to be black. That latter statement, which is literally what Dr. King advocated for, I am a man, was the slogan in the, the civil rights movement, at least in Memphis in the, the later 1960s. She says, strives for a certain universality that ignores the imposition of racial categories on people. 
Whereas I am black leans into that identity category and enables the ability to do identity politics. In order, in order, other words, it enables the ability to create a a political activist block that uses identity, something as immutable and and, and sensitive as identity, to try to move its ball. And the, the the doctrine of structural determinism is how it does this, because of structural determinism, they believe in what are what's known as authentic racial experiences or authentic racial knowledges, which means if you agree with critical race theories, take on what your race is supposed to experience, then you have it authentically. And if not, you have internalized racism, false consciousness of some kind or something, and you're not expressing your uh, racial experience authentically. In other words, you're being duplicitous, selfish, or willfully ignorant in some way, um, which means you can't disagree with critical race theory, even if you are uh, of that particular, uh, of whatever particular racial minority group that it happens to be spoken about. They say that that gives rise to a unique voice of color so that each, each color, each racial category or each identity category, if we get more intersectional, as they say with it, um, has a unique structurally determined experience and that there's a unique voice that speaks to that experience. And when it's authentic, in other words, when it repeats critical race theory, then it's, uh, speaking into that unique voice of color and therefore it contains the idea. It has knowledge that other, other racial groups don't have access to. So white people can't understand black people except by shut up and listen. That's one of their phrases. Um, and even then you still can't understand. So you have to keep shutting up and keep listening uh, because there's a unique voice of color that derives from this idea of authentic racial experiences that derives from the doctrine of structural determinism in the under the broad assumption of a ordinary state of affairs of systemic racism that's been imposed upon society by uh, power hungry whites who are equi are, are functionally identical to the bourgeoisie that Marx was complaining about white white supremacy culture or white co culture or whiteness is identical to bourgeoisie uh, functionally speaking. Um, there's a demand, therefore, to engage your positionality always. You aren't able to speak as an individual who has studied or has thought or has worked or has done or whatever. You have to speak as a black man, as a Latina or Latinx woman, because you, you, you have to speak into your identity category because identity categories are believed to be productive of authoritative knowledge. And therefore, methodologies, rigorous methodologies and truth are not expected to be productive of authoritative knowledge. They are in fact, something that's characterized as being located within the so-called white racial frame of the entire liberal order, enlightenment, rationalism, and so on. It therefore engages in identity politics because identity groups become unique blocks. Um, it cares about the impact over the intent. If somebody perceives that they've been ra uh, experienced racism, then they have, and you have to shut up and listen to just accept that. Um, it favors narrative and storytelling and even counter storytelling over facts and uh, evidence and uh, rationality and reason. The idea is to tell that story, which obviously we've all heard, you know, I know somebody who smoked pack a day and lived to be 90. Well, you know, that's called the exception. <laughs> um, but they, they will talk into that exception and say, well, you can't say that, that we're wrong. Or they will tell the story. We heard this very frequently when after George Floyd died that, you know, well, how many actually unarmed black people were killed by police in say 2019? I think the answer, I mean, any acceptable answer I think is somewhere that's truthful is between something like seven and 16 or something like that. I don't remember the exact number. Maybe it's nine. Um, somewhere in that vicinity, but they say that they feel like they are being killed in the streets by police every single day. Well, it's narrative and storytelling. We see the idea of the narrative all throughout the media. You know, look at what's happening again with the Asian American situation. They believe in revisionist history, retelling history from the perspective of critical race theory. That's what the 1619 Project is about. If you didn't know, it's it's not even intended to be history. It's to foist a story and a perspective upon history so that history is now selectively told to uphold the critical race theory narrative. And as you would have already gathered, it's fundamentally anti-liberal, and I mean liberal in the classically liberal sense, the exact sense that, say, Thomas Jefferson was talking about when he talked about our, um, you know, the, the, the truths that we take to be self-evident. Um, when he talked about people being, you know, created equal and, and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, including life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, 
those things are to be drawn into question that we can appeal to our reason and that we can appeal to, to methods and practices and, 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 and uh, I guess epistemological tools. I didn't want to have to say it that way that allow us to get to better answers to hard questions. Um, that's all just going to be cast into a, a white cultural frame or a white racial frame or white Eurocentric masculine frame, uh, which is basically repeating the same mistakes that we've seen before. We saw the, the you know, kind of close here to give you to just kind of like wrap up of how dramatic this is, because I know I'm getting to the time, but we saw the Bolsheviks talk about communist science versus bourgeois science. And this is the same thing. We saw uh, Hitler talk about Jewish science versus whatever he was doing. This is the same thing. This is, in a sense, when I say that we're talking about a 100-year-long spear, I know that's a stupid metaphor, with a very sharp tip called critical race theory that is tearing Western society open. What we're talking about is the reinvention and kind of, of, of all the worst ideas of the 20th century, the least American ideas of the 20th century, and cramming them into a purposeful tool that's used to infiltrate our institutions because people aren't willing to either understand what it is or to just stand up and resist it and to realize that just because some lunatic called you a racist, that doesn't mean that you're a racist. Just because some lunatic said that these are aspects of white supremacy culture that can be tied in some way as to having been rooted in some white supremacist that they can dig up in a history book doesn't mean that something like productivity is a white supremacist value. It is actually a value that works. Um, so this is the danger that critical race theory poses. It's already infiltrated most of our institutions. We've now seen the scary video from the CIA. I mean, just pause and reflect on that for a minute. Uh, we've already seen the the infiltration into the military with their extremism stand down and the fact that they're doing diversity, equity, and inclusion, which is all rooted in this stuff. You see the eruptions when you try to get it taken out. When you see these Republican uh, state legislatures and governors trying to knock it out of schools. You see they go berserk and try to accuse people, of, Trump did it as well, uh, of trying to just ban diversity training or teaching of history. Um, we're in a precarious position, therefore. There are reasons for hope, like I started with, and I'll close there. There's a lot of energy to take this on now, and a lot of people are aware of it, and I'm honored to be able to come help more people become more aware of just how bad a set of ideas this is, just how dangerous a set of ideas this is. But I don't want anybody to go away with a false impression. Like America is legitimately, and Western civilization is legitimately at risk. Critical race theory may not be the entire story. There are others. I saw some of the questions and I think we might end up touching on some of that, but um, it is the tool that's making it all possible. The other metaphor I like to give for it is that it's the lock pick that's opening the gates to Western civilization. So I'd like for you to think of it that way going forward and to think very seriously about getting at least cursorily educated in it, organizing around it and doing any activism that you know the various leaders coming out of this institute are going to take into the to the social and political world whether it's organizing at the level of school boards and grassroots or whether it's organizing even for national campaigns all right thank you so much dr lindsay you really packed a lot into an hour there um <laughs> We And for those of you who have asked, and also Dr. Lindsay, we do record these and then post them online. So I'll make sure that you all get the link uh, so you can watch it again, because <laughs> that was quite the dense presentation. So thank you so much. Uh, Morton had to go chair another meeting. So I'll be closing here. And uh, I did want to squeeze in a couple of questions since we are kind of running over time. Um, but you're welcome to stay on with us if you'd like to. Um, so one of the most common questions we got in was how, how can we fight this? How, what can be done on specifically a grass, grassroots level? Um, you know, Leadership Institute, we're a little biased because we consider ourselves a do tank, not a think tank. And we've got great people like you on, on the think tank side of things um, doing all the thoughts. But um, what can we do on a grassroots level with campaigning or just person to person to combat this type of harmful ideology? It's actually pretty simple. If you would ask me this a few months ago, I would have been like deer in headlights, but it's actually fairly simple. The model we just saw take place in Texas is, so you should look at what happened and you're gonna have to fight through a little bit in BS narrative, but um, you really should take a look at what happened. You had what very simply happened is you had parents and some other people that organized 
they got informed enough. You have to learn, I'm sorry, you have to learn the basics of this stuff. You do have to learn a little bit about what it's about. Then they got organized and they showed up in a group and they literally took over a school board and the vote went 70 to 30 in their favor. Um, so learning a little bit about it and getting organized and then just showing up is more than you think it is. These activists usually like to operate in the quiet. I don't want to like portray them as like something gross or whatever, but they don't like people to see what they're doing. They actually want to do this as secretly and quietly as possible. They show up there. The, the world is being run right now by people who like to go to meetings. So if you become people who will go to meetings too, all of a sudden they reach opposition. They don't have evidence. They don't have arguments. All they have is calling people names and flipping out. And if you actually show up, then it's very easy to start turning over at the bottom level, like grassroots, like school boards, city commissions, county commissions, et cetera, to start flipping these things over and start pushing this stuff out. You do have to be willing to push it out though. You have to be willing to actually say, no, we're not going to do this. And then weather the insane storm that's going to come and get your talking points in order before you do to understand, because they're going to come back at you. Oh, you're limiting our first amendment rights. No, you're not. The state doesn't have first amendment rights. You have to be able to answer that just like that individuals have first amendment rights to protect them from the impositions of the state. It's not the other way around. The state doesn't have any right to, to say certain things to kids in schools. That right doesn't exist. The state is not granted a first amendment right. So you have to be able to very quickly come back with these things and they say, Oh, well, you know, academic freedom. And you have to be able to say, well, there's nothing prohibiting you from teaching critical race theory. There's only something prohibiting you from teaching critical race theory as uncontested fact and without some alternative without other perspectives. And that all like teaches an academic theory, go right ahead. And they don't want to do that, of course. So there's, there's actually very easy things to do. Get a little bit informed. I try to put out a lot of resources for it. Other people are doing it. If you don't like my style, that's fine. I don't care. Um, organize and show up. Another thing is that people are desperate. What I hear from people all the time is I feel like I'm alone. Start changing that. You are actually, if you are against this, you're actually in not just a majority and not even just in a super majority, but like a super, super majority. The overwhelming number of people hate this stuff. Overwhelming number of people do not like it. And every one of them feels like they're the only one. So you start figuring out ways to build networks where everyday people in everyday life can figure out how to connect to one another. That's huge. Um, I'll tell you another example of something that people can do on the grassroots level. So recently, one of the first states to try to pass a bill against this stuff in their schools was New Hampshire. And a woman took up the leadership role, Leadership Institute. So here you go. All she did was organized people to show up to the Zoom call in the different reg legislative committee meetings. All she did was made sure I got the email. Hey, come speak, a, come testify. Hey, it's going to be at this time. Can you make it? Hey, I liaised with the, the committee to make sure they know you're coming and that you're an important person. Somebody who does that basic organizing stuff, I know that we're not supposed to use the word community organizer, but that makes it easy for people who do have the knowledge, who do have the willpower, who do have the, the skills to show and do have the leadership to show up to things they wouldn't otherwise know are happening. So people should get on the ground and figure out what's going on in these different state level or local level races or, or uh, meetings or concerns or whatever. And how do we get people there who can make an impact? How do we organize and make sure that there are going to be 50 people to speak up on behalf? How, are we, how do we make sure that Governor Stitt in Oklahoma just received over a thousand emails in support of a similar bill that's on the floor in Oklahoma, on his desk now in Oklahoma, it passed the floor. Uh, so people taking up that basic leadership role of organizing, doing that grunt work of, I'm terrible at organizing. So people who do that are going to change the world. So that's a, that's a do tank kind of activity that you can definitely lean into. And if you don't want to do any of that, you know, my Christian friends say you have to lean into your gifts of spirit. So what are they? You know, do you, do you connect well with people? Do you, can you create, I just went to a little meeting with these women that my wife's friends with, and they just meet once every two weeks to like vent like a little support group for themselves. Like, can you do that? Can you have a, like a potluck dinner at your house every two weeks for people that you found at your church or in your, your community or at your kid's school or whatever, where you can get together and just kind of vent about this. And that's where organization starts happening. Like, what can you do? Do you have money? Can you give it to somebody that's, that, that's trying to take up the fight in a more public way than you feel comfortable doing? Can you offer words of support? Can you dig up stories that people might dig into and get them to where people with more prominence, like in the friendly media, Tucker Carlson or something might start talking about them. All of those are things that people can do very easily. Most importantly, though, I want people to come away understanding that a year ago, you were risking a lot to speak up against this. And right now, if you take that leap of faith into fighting this stuff, the crowd is going to come up underneath you and catch you. It's ready to catch you and carry you. So don't be afraid to do it either.
No, that's that's great words of advice and a shameless plug for Leadership Institute. We train you all to do those kinds of things. So, uh, <laughs> and we do redirect you to our training schedule after this. And again, the links to this discussion and everything will be sent out to you if you're on our email list. If you've attended, you should be on it. Um, and again, thank you, Dr. James Lindsay. This was great. Um, one little tradition we have is sending an Adam Smith tie to all of our speakers. So you can expect one in the mail. And um, yeah, get excited now. <laughs> and um, for our attendees, please join us on June 2 for our next virtual Windsor Wake Up Club breakfast with Mike Thompson from CRC Advisors. And I encourage you to RSVP online at leadershipinstitute.org forward slash breakfast. And thank you all for joining us online this morning. And until next time, stay well. Thank you so much for watching. If you wanna check out our latest video, click right here. And if you wanna stay up to date on all of our content, don't forget to subscribe here.